So imagine, if you will, this story that Emerson read us. Imagine that you are one of Jesus' 12 disciples. And up until now, you've been listening to Jesus, you've been watching Jesus, you've been walking with Jesus, going with him to different places. You, you've heard his teaching, right? You've heard him preach the Sermon on the Mount. You've kind of been wrestling with many of the things that he said and his own words and how they impact your life or how they even change your, your thinking and your view of the world. You, you've been with Jesus and witnessed him heal people, like actually cleanse lepers and open blind eyes. You, you've watched him throw demons out of people. And with every new miracle, every new moment, every new day, something else just blows your mind. And one day you even watch Jesus raise a little girl from the dead. And you keep wondering and you're, you're marveling at all these things that are happening around you and watching and you're wondering to yourself, what kind of man is this? Like, who is this guy? And maybe there's some faith that's beginning to spark in your heart and, and you've even thought to yourself, could this really be? Could this be the son of God? I mean, who else could, could say the kind of things that this guy is saying? Who else could do the kind of things that that he's doing with this kind of authority. I've never met anyone like this in my entire life. Of course, there have been times like when you're out on the lake and there was such a big storm that you almost died. Or the times when, when Jesus is locking horns with the religious authorities and, and arguing pretty heatedly with them that the things to be, get to be a little bit uncomfortable as you witness them. And and you might ask yourself, okay, what, am, what in the world have I gotten myself into following this guy? In town after town and village after village, you've watched Jesus open deaf ears and, and open blind eyes and open mute mouths. You, you've witnessed his tireless ministry. You've fallen asleep during some of his sermons. Maybe in the morning after you woke up, he's already awake, praying seriously, having conversation with an invisible conversation partner, his, his father. So, so you've been watching all this. You, you've been wrestling with what it means for your life. And yet, there, there's still a sense as you follow Jesus, as you listen to him, as you watch him, there, there's still a sense that you're on the sidelines, Right? It's Jesus who's, who's doing all these mighty works. It's, it's Jesus who's saying all these amazing things. It's, it's these people who he's touching and healing, and you're just kind of eyewitness to all of it. In, in some sense, you've merely been an observer. And after all this time, one day, Jesus turns to you. He looks you in the eye, and he says, now it's your turn. Now you go do what I've been doing. And how would that sit with you? That would be like, Dr. Noah's not here this morning, but that would be like him handing me a scalpel and said, here, you do the surgery. You deliver the baby. Or, or maybe me asking you, hey, you come preach the sermon this morning. Or whatever it might be, one of those things that, is just, that you feel is just beyond you completely. Hold on, you want me to What? You want me to go and cast out demons and heal people and preach the gospel? Jesus is, is now beginning to call his, his observing disciples who've walked with him and seen and heard all these stuff. He's now calling them off of the sidelines and into the game. This is a, this is a crucial understanding, a crucial change in discipleship. Because following Jesus from this moment on will never mean sitting on the sidelines. Following Jesus will never mean merely being an observer. Discipleship always entails action. It always means obedience. And that the action and the obedience that Jesus calls us to here, that this story points us to, is the, is the work of mission. If you look back at chapter 9, at the very end of chapter 9, Jesus is, is doing ministry and then he has compassion. It says he has compassion on the people. And then he asks his disciples to do something key, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. But there's this, there's this change that happens from chapter 9, verse 35, into chapter 10. Now, if you, if you remember this, 
the original Bibles, the original manuscript, didn't have any numbers in it. Okay? It didn't have the big chapter 10 number. It didn't have the verse numbers. It was just one continuous narrative. So there's, there's no distinction here going from verse 38 to verse 10. But the end of verse uh, 38 of chapter 9, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, Pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. And then he begins to pass the baton of ministry to his disciples. There's a, there's a training exercise here that, that will anticipate what comes later, which we'll talk about in, in chapter 28. But here Jesus is calling his disciples off the sideline, handing them a baton of ministry. So he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were troubled and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. And he, he turns to his disciples and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but guess what? There's not enough workers, there's not enough laborers. So pray or plead earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So Jesus had been teaching, praying, and healing everywhere, but then now he turns with this tremendous heart of compassion He turns to his disciples and commands them to enter the game. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So we have to assume that something happens and that they actually obey this command between chapter 9, verse 38, and chapter 10, verse 1. Plead earnestly to the Lord of the harvest because what happens in the very next verse, perhaps to their surprise, is that they now become the answer to their own prayer. Okay, so we're assuming that they actually obeyed Jesus and prayed for him. Maybe they prayed, hey God, would you send out workers into the field? Or maybe they turned to Jesus and asked him, and then he turns to them and says, okay, now that you've prayed that prayer, you're the ones who are gonna go. Verse one, summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every sickness. And if you jump down to verse 5, it says, he sent these 12 out, commanding them, saying, don't go by the way of the Gentiles and don't enter a Samaritan city, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of the heavens has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. And so right away, in response to this prayer, Jesus the great shepherd sends out shepherd laborers into the fields in the same way that he himself has gone out as a shepherd into the fields. And Jesus' is, is ministry and mission, his, what he has been doing now becomes his disciples' ministry and mission. And the task that he gives them actually maps perfectly word for word with the work that he himself has been doing. So the exact phrase that we have in chapter 9, verse 35, that Jesus was healing every disease and every sickness, is now what the disciples are given authority to do in chapter 10, verse 1. Heal every disease and every sickness. And then in verse 8, when we see a summary of what he's sending them out to do, preaching, healing, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, casting out demons, these are all the works that up to this point only Jesus has had the authority to do. So take a moment just to sit with that sheer magnitude. God sends his son into the world to do something, and then that son turns right around to these guys and says, go do the same thing. There's a seismic shift in ministry and mission. Jesus is sharing his authority with his disciples. And that's explained as a, as a power for them to be able to go and exert influence, not only in the physical world, but in the, fi- the spiritual realm as well. So they can go and do the very things he's been doing. I'll reference a couple Marvel movies here, kids. Okay, we're going to Disney to Marvel, but Disney owns Marvel, so it's all Disney this morning, I guess. With great power becomes great responsibility, right, Spider-Man, Okay. Um, in one of the Avenger movies, I think it's the Age of Ultron, it's this, either the second or the eighth one, I can't remember, um, the Avengers are sitting around at Tony Stark's house, right, and in the middle of them, they're, they're having a party, and in the middle is M- Mjolnir, is that his name? Is that the, that's the hammer's name, right? Thor's hammer uh, is called Mjolnir. It's this hammer that only Thor can pick up. He's the only one who is worthy, that has the power to pick it up, and they have this 
competition to see if anybody else can even get it to budge. And, and they're all kind of laughing and they're all feeling bad. Nobody can get it to move and Captain America almost gets it to budge and Thor gets really nervous about that, you know, right? But nobody else is worthy to pick up Thor's hammer. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like that feeling now. Now, Jesus is much greater than Thor, by the way. Um, Jesus has this authority, and it's like this hammer that only the Son of God can pick up, and now he's handing it to his disciples and say, here, you go. You have that same power. You now get to do the same things that I've been doing. So this transition, this, this shift of the work and the authority from Jesus to his disciples, how does it happen? What's the connection? Well, the connection is there in chapter 9, verse 38. The connection is prayer. Friends, this says a tremendous amount about the role of prayer in ministry and in mission. It says a tremendous amount about the role of prayer in our own lives, of discipleship. Prayer is tapping into God's power to accomplish the things that God already wants to accomplish. So God is saying, Jesus is saying, I have a heart for these people. I want laborers to go out and work for them. And then he says, just pray for the thing that I already want to happen. Ask me to do the thing that I've already said I want to do. And throughout his word, God has given us promises. He said that he is going to do things. And when we pray in his name, all he's calling us to do is say, is to pray for the things that he wants to happen. That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name. Pray with his heart with his compassion, with his promises and his ends in mind. And that's what he calls us to do as we go on mission. Pray that I will do through you the very things I want to do. And I'm convinced that if and when we lead with humility, which is what prayer by definition is, it's humility, God uses that to to transmit authority to us that would not otherwise be accessible. He does that as he gives us his spirit and sends us on mission. So does mission and ministry scare you? Does it frighten you to say, I'm going to go out in Jesus' name and preach the gospel? Does that make you nervous? Pray. That's the answer. Pray. Ask for God to do through you what only he can do. Do you long to be used by Jesus to reach people and to lead them to him? Is that a longing of your heart? Pray. Do you not know how he wants to use you? Do you not know what Jesus wants to do through you? Well, what's the answer? Pray. Absolutely. Authority is granted through prayer, and it's an authority that only the humble can carry. So, So in answer to their prayers, the Lord of the harvest, Jesus now places his authority into their hands, but he places it into the hands of these less than capable and less than qualified men. So let's look at this list of guys that he chooses. Verse two of chapter 10. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Then James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. And Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, and then Simon the Cananean, or Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who also betrayed him. So if we just work slowly through this list of names, we've got four fishermen, right? So four pretty blue-collar businessmen kind of guys, probably a little bit rough around the edges. One of these guys we know, Simon Peter, would eventually buckle under pressure and completely deny that he even knows Jesus. Two of these fishermen get nicknamed by Jesus Sons of Thunder, which is a pretty cool name if you're a young man. But likely Jesus named them that because these are the guys that wanted to call down fire from heaven on these dudes that they didn't like. That's the kind of guys these were. Okay, another disciple was a doubtful cynic. You remember Doubting Thomas? Another had spent a lifetime selling himself out to the Romans so that he could make money. Another of them was likely a member, this is Simon the Zealot, the Canaanian, likely he was a member of a violent anti-Roman paramilitary group. 
So you have this guy who's been working for the Romans, and then right next to him, a guy that hates the Romans. So they probably got along well. And then to round out the list, you have a thief whose name has gone down in history as being synonymous with betrayal and treason, Judas Iscariot. So the point here isn't that Jesus is a bad judge of character and shouldn't be put in charge of picking teams. It's not the point that's being made. The point is that when Jesus does pick teams, it's the unexpected, the unsavory, the unpopular, the, uh, the unattractive, the ungifted, the unqualified, the unable. In other words, the very last people that you and I would pick are the ones who make the cut with Jesus. It's like giving Thor's hammer to Loki or, or giving your car keys to your toddler. It seems foolish, but the beautiful thing about it is that Jesus can use anyone. He can even use you. He can even use me to love his sheep and work his harvest. And in the end, it doesn't really depend on you or me. It doesn't depend on our talents or our abilities it, or our skills or our maturity at all. It completely depends on the work that Jesus wants to do through us. It depends on his power, his thing. And once again, we should be driven back to humility because if we're all honest, we don't have what it takes to fulfill Jesus' mission. But he's sending us anyway. The authority which Jesus gives is, as C.S. Lewis once pointed out, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken. The load so heavy that only humility can carry it, and the backs of the proud will be broken. Okay, so what is our mission? What is our mission? Well, I want to just point out four things from the text, and then I'm going to go find some air conditioning. First thing from the text, Jesus provides the resources for mission. Jesus provides the resources for mission. So, so verse one, it says, he gave them authority. He gave it to them. They didn't go find it. They didn't create it. He gave them the authority. So the question is, does Jesus give all of his disciples in every time and place the same authority that he gives to his 12 apostles in this moment? In other words, do we now have the authority to cast out demons and to raise the dead and to heal the sick and all these things? What authority do we have today? And I would argue that the point of, of this passage isn't that we have the same authority as them, but the point of the passage is that when Jesus asks you to do something, he empowers you to do it. So he's asking them to do a very specific ministry in this passage, and he's giving them the authority and the power to do it. And when he calls us on mission, as he will in about 17 chapters, he will give us the authority and the empowerment to do it. So, so I don't think that this passage gives all of Jesus' disciples blanket authority to do miraculous works. It's very clear that this authority was given in the moment to the 12. You won't find another place in Scripture where all of Jesus' disciples are given a mandate or authority to perform or accomplish miracles like these. But later, in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus will say, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to who? To him, right? He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. But the, the task of making disciples doesn't entail the same thing that these disciples are doing here. Rather, what we're commanded to do is to go and make disciples and baptize and teach them. So the, the empowerment for mission in this story is disseminated. It's given by Jesus, but in Matthew 28, the authority is held by Jesus. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me, therefore go. And so Jesus who ascends to heaven now, has distributed the empowerment that we need, and that is called the Holy Spirit. He's given his people the Holy Spirit. So I don't think it's out of line to claim that the resource we have been given for the mission we have been sent on is the Holy Spirit himself. And what, what more empowerment do we need? Jesus provides the resources for mission. Secondly, Jesus defines our mission field. 
verses 5 and 6. He says to the disciples, Don't go into the way of the Gentiles and don't enter a Samaritan city, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And these disciples had a specific mission field, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There's probably something just geographic to that. Like, don't go way up north where the Gentiles are. Don't go way south where the Samaritans are. Just be local. Just hang out here. There's enough to do. Go to the lost sheep of the house of, of Israel. So, so our question should be, what is the mission field which Jesus has sent me to? In this particular story, we see Jesus' heart for his scattered and discouraged sheep, the people of Israel. But Jesus' mission doesn't stop there. He will eventually, again in Matthew 28, tell his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. But that's not happening yet. And on their first mission, these disciples are sent just to the people of Israel. He was giving these men a limited scope, a limited mission field. And I think he actually does that with all of us. He gives us specific mission fields. Sometimes it happens to be an individual or two, maybe that we know, or, or a neighborhood that we live in, or if you're a student or a teacher, a class of students. Maybe it's a group of colleagues at work, or maybe it's some family members or your family as a whole. Others might be called to larger entire people groups or cities or countries, but I don't think it's saying too much to claim that Jesus sovereignly gives each of us a mission field. Now, some of us have such big hearts, like Jesus, that we look at the world and our heart breaks with compassion because of all the needs that are out there. And it's easy to pretty soon find yourself overwhelmed with just the sheer immensity of the task. But as a wise person, one wiser than me, told me one time, the need isn't the call. If the need was the call, then we would be called to every individual on planet Earth. The need isn't the call. The call is the call. We must allow Jesus to define our mission field because we will be the most fruitful when the mission is clearly defined. Jesus, who are you calling me to? Where's my mission field? And on the other hand, we might be people who ignore the mission field because we're scared, because we're too busy, Maybe we're just flat out selfish or greedy, whatever. And we intentionally ignore God's call into the harvest. But remember, we've been given Jesus' own authority, his own empowerment. And fear, for one thing, doesn't have any place when Jesus has empowered us. What we need is spirit-led direction and discernment to gain clarity. I think we all need this, to gain clarity clarity on the mission field that God has called us to. Remember what I said earlier, if we don't know where our mission field is, what should we do? Pray. And we need prayerful, bold, compassionate obedience to fulfill the task that Jesus has called us to, that he's given us empowerment for. The third point, Jesus defines the mission field, but Jesus also sends shepherds. He sends us as shepherds, not just leaders, not just elders and pastors, but he sends us as shepherds. Go to the lost sheep, verse 6. The heart of Jesus is a shepherd's heart of care and compassion. And joining him on ministry is to, to entails that we go with the same heart that Jesus has for his sheep. So, so what does it look like then to be a compassionate shepherd to the people that Jesus has sent you to? The overarching tasks of a shepherd are to protect, protect the sheep, care for the sheep, feed the sheep, make sure they have all the things that they need, and lead them. This is the same kind of thing that Jesus himself did, and shepherds are given care for the flock. They're to give time and care and compassion and service to every single sheep, no matter how ornery they are, no matter how much they bite, No matter how much they stink, no matter how lost they are, no matter how sick they are. Remember, Jesus says, a good shepherd will go after the one and leave the 99 behind. This is what Jesus wants in his shepherds, those who see needs and immediately go to meet them. And overall, the character of a shepherd is one who serves. 
And as we're sent into the harvest to whoever God would send us to, this is how we're to go as servants. We're to be like Jesus, servants who are willing to lay down our life for the sake of his chosen sheep. Now the question is, what does it mean for you to lay your life down? The fourth point here, Jesus sends shepherds, but Jesus' mission entails both gospel proclamation and gospel embodiment. So he says, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, preach. Preach, proclaim the word. The kingdom of the heavens has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. So the first thing that Jesus commands these men to do is to proclaim the kingdom, to speak, to preach, to announce the good news. Good news is just another way of saying the gospel. But what is the gospel he commands them to preach? Now, in your mind, when I ask that question, it's very likely that you said, well, it's the message of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, that he died for us so that we could believe in him, we put our faith in him, receive forgiveness of sins, be reconciled to the Father, that we could have eternal life. Let me ask you this. I don't mean to ruffle any feathers here, but has Jesus died yet in this story? Has he been resurrected yet? Has he gone to heaven yet? Okay, so the message that he's asking them to preach is actually bigger than that. The message he's telling them to preach is to go and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Go and speak about the king who has come. The king who has not only come, but is displaying that he's the king through all these mighty works that he is doing. Jesus, when he came on the scene, what did he say? What was the first thing that he said? Well, it was actually the same thing that John the Baptist was preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now he gives his disciples this very same message. The good news that the king has come. His kingdom has broken into the world, and we can see it because of these mighty works. And this, brothers and sisters, is still the good news of the kingdom. That the king has come. That the king has come and changed everything forever. Not only has he come, but we get to preach, we get to fill in the blanks, by the way, because we know the story that this king has died and he's been buried and he's come back to life and overcome death and he now sits sits as king over all of creation and he will one day come back and make everything right. That is the good news of the kingdom. It's full orbed and Jesus was sending these men as as his forerunner, saying, go and tell them that the king is coming. The king is coming to their city, and he's healing, and he's casting out demons, and he's opening blind eyes and, and deaf ears, and he's doing these things. And when the king comes, our only option is to repent and submit. And brothers and sisters, that's what faith is. It's repenting and submitting to King Jesus. And when we do that, all the blessings that come with it, the blessings of forgiveness, of reconciliation, of eternal life. He's called us as his disciples as well to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. But he's also commanded us to embody the gospel of the kingdom. So to these disciples, he said, go and heal the sick, just like I've been doing. Go and raise the dead, just like I've been doing. Go and cleanse lepers, just like I've been doing. Go and throw out demons, just like I've been doing. Embody the reality of the kingdom for people so that they can see the presence of this new reality. And as has already been said, I don't think these things are expected of his disciples today. I don't think we have to cast out demons or raise the dead. I'm not saying that God can't do that. I don't, I'm just not sure that it's part of our job description. So what does gospel embodiment then look for us today? I think it mo- looks more like, as Jesus has called us to, serving and laying our lives down for people as a picture to them of how Jesus himself has loved them. Jesus calls us as his missionary people to embody and proclaim 
the life-giving fullness of the gospel. So in conclusion, let me just give you four words to take from here. And here's the words. Prayer, empowerment, humility, and mission. Prayer, empowerment, humility, and mission. And our responsibility may not be the same as these 12 disciples. Our job may not be the same as them. But the privilege of being Jesus' ambassadors, the privilege of being his sent laborers into the harvest through the empowerment of the Spirit is certainly no less than their privilege. Will we take it on as a church? Will we be a people who go in the empowerment of of the Holy Spirit to love and to serve, to embody and to proclaim the life-giving fullness of the gospel. Would you pray with me? Jesus, as we come, we are so thankful. We're so thankful for the fullness, the life-giving fullness of the gospel that includes your death, your burial, your resurrection on our behalf, your sacrifice and your, your, your taking our place and forgiving our sins, purchasing forgiveness and eternal life for us. Lord, we're so thankful. We're also thankful that you did that as the king and you sit even now as the enthroned king. You've brought your kingdom, which is already present and not yet fully present. And here we are, laborers ready to go into the harvest or maybe laborers who are cringing from the harvest or fatigued from the harvest or whatever that might be for us, Lord. We pray for your encouragement. We pray for your Holy Spirit to empower us. We pray that you would give us clarity on what our mission field is and who are those people you have put into our lives to serve and to love and to share the good news with. Father, would you send us? Would you make us people who Humbly pray because we need clarity. We need your empowerment. We're in situations where we need you to work and need you to speak. Jesus, we thank you that you've given us your word, which is the power of God. Thank you that you've given us the gospel, which is the power of God to salvation. And that we can take that to a needy neighborhood, to needy family members, to needy colleagues who don't know you. Father, we pray that you would do through us the very things you want to do through us and that you would find us willing, obedient, humble servants and laborers for the sake of your kingdom and your glory. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.